So you will see we've just moved to a different location. This is so that we can see um, all of us from head to foot, or at least all of Jim, and um, really so that we can talk about the um, what do you call it? The the kind of the foot. The, the foot movement. Position. Yeah. Yeah, and well, just how I think. And the extension motions that relate to the, the balance motions. Balance that's motions, it. That's really balance it. motions. So, 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 what are they? Well, the balance motions, oh, the, I mean, these are sort of almost the stretchy warm up type things. You know, every martial art has some, you know, version of that. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, the instructions for all of these are that I'm supposed to be, the instructor is supposed to bear down upon my shoulders to make sure they don't rise. Ah, that's okay. A very explicit instruction. Right. And, and why is that? Why don't you want a person to rise? You don't want to do that. That's leakage. Right. That means you're not, um, you know, if you're doing that, you're basically not using that full tensegrity structure. Right. Which is okay. Uh, yeah. And this, and in your your theory is this relates to um, cutting method definitely, as well. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. So, what are the the balance motions that they do with the legs? It looked to me mm -hmm. like it was. I always assumed it was related to the practice of the footwork that was used in the fencing system. Right. So relating to advancing, retreating, there was a crossing of feet, which well, is n interestingly usually yeah. avoided in sabre footwork. Sabre. It's, it, there's no practical application. Okay. It's really just to force you into one or the other pronate, because you supinate out. Uh -huh. And then, I didn't wear the right pants. <laughs> also wearing long john. Luckily they don't overextend. So you've actually got your hands behind your back at this point. Yes, that's because right. Because yeah. you're not using them. Um, so what you have to do is then bring this back here, just a touch. Yeah. Now if you're supinated here. You See, to me, that looks that. like slipping the leg against a cut. It could be. So it's like practicing. Yeah. Um, so obviously if you're fighting someone and they faint high, so you guard high, and then they cut at your leg, you have to slip the leg. But curiously, in Angelo's system, he slips the leg with every guard. So in actual fact, if we were doing Angelo, as soon as I form the guard against the faint, I'd slip the leg at the same time. So that's where Angelo is different to what I teach and practice, which is later putting and weight. That's over but. my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing extension motions. So, the thing is, if you, you can't really supinate into that position. It just doesn't work. So if you pronate, you get back okay. here, okay. which sets you up to the rising part. which then That's almost supinate. like getting your hips aligned so that you can get the foot back as well. It, oh, it could yeah. be, yeah. I mean, again, I don't know the applications for this. Okay. But if I, then I'm kind of locked in pronation, which means to rise, I can only supinate. Right. And then if you supinate, and at this point, the instructor is supposed to test my structure. So right, you, give me, okay. you push me around a little bit. Right. And you see whether I can hold that. And that supination gives me a lot of structure. I mean, give me a little push. Yeah, not, not tons, but you've yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like I mean, I can feel, I can feel that. Just yeah, I mean, usually if your feet were in this position, you'd be quite unstable. Yeah, and I am pretty unstable. So, <laughs> so what you've done is you've yeah, you've put your feet in an unstable position. Yeah. But you have done it in such a way that it's made you as stable as you can yeah. be with your feet in those in that position. Yeah. You just rise. I mean, if I just rise, you can feel the yeah. difference. Right. Push me again. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, just oh yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. you've got a you've got a triangle kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's also you're kind of gripping. It'll right. make more sense to ballet people. Right. But um, so yeah, and then you you know supinate it, pronate it now, <laughs> supinate again. No, I'm in supination. Yeah. Pronation. Right. And then I supinate again to bring it back up. Okay. And uh, same thing with the mysterious second extension motions. Was that one the one with the elbow to the knee? Right, okay, so this is the one that is not shown in the 1845 manual, but is shown in the 1813 and 1817 manual. And the cutlass poster. Yes, which is 1813. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, for some reason, there's the one position that's shown in the earlier stuff, but it's not shown in the later stuff. Why do you think? I, I just think it's because it's really hard. It's my favorite. And uh, Okay, I'm, so tell us about that one then. What it... Oh, I mean, oh. Why is it your favorite? Because <laughs> it's cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you've, you've supinated out, you've, uh -huh. um, you've stepped out, and there's a very specific way you're supposed to bring the arms in position. You uh -huh. do it like that, elbows are down, and you come out like that. Okay, so yeah. That's actually extremely difficult. That looks like the picture. If you look at the yeah. picture from the 18th, you can see exactly it looks like that, yeah. And that's not easy to do. There's lots of things that you want to do that. Right. But you have to keep that down. There's instructions, the elbows stay up. You know, it really is about making this line with the, again, the supination. You're going to get sick of that word. <laughs> and then you, uh, 
And then one that came later, you just go straight into this pronation upwards, bend the leg, okay. and you come down into supination. But in the earlier ones, they had a much trickier one where you're pronating into that position. You're bringing this, the back is up, the head is up. Okay. And you're kind of coming down like that. But keeping the head up. Keeping the head up, yeah. yeah. I'm not doing a very good job. I mean, incidentally, for, for any of you who've done foil fencing or, or small sword, of course, you'll recognize some of these positions. You know, if you've got an on guard position there and we come into a lunge, you're essentially there in supina supination, right. aren't you? Um, but then you come back to uh, pronation, that would be. Yep. Okay? So essentially, coming from on guard in a small sword or foil, you're in pronation. Bearing in mind, in modern foil, you'll be in sicked, which is kind of contradictory. <laughs> but in, in traditional foil, you'd be in terse usually. Or you might be in, in cart. Okay? But anyway, that's for a different uh, thing. But assuming we're in terse here, and then when you say, for example, we come into cart with the lunge, and the arm comes down, um, this is very similar to the positions we're seeing in this, um, oh, yeah. sure. in the manual, aren't we? So... Well, the, the point of all of this stuff is the idea that the military sabre, or the English sword exercise, British sword exercise. British, yeah. There we go. <laughs> it's the idea that it has to, it's a movement that's going from supination to pronation. And in this particular system, you're using supination for the attack and pronation for the guard, in my opinion. Right. Which is different from the later Italian system where it gets reversed. So, so can you explain what you mean by that? By, so supination for the guard and pronation for the attack? Reverse. Oh, reverse. So supination for the attack and pronation for the guard. So what do you mean by that? Well, the idea is supination locks your torso up a little bit. That's mm -hmm. why if you look at ballet, it's a very equestrian thing. You know, you're riding a horse, you're kind of up like that. Mm -hmm. And then this comes, pronation is more about that frontwards thing. Mm -hmm. and you can supinate that crazy hit that I don't know if anyone actually does it, where you supinate all the way on the back of your horse. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. On the, yeah. So yeah, you, know, you <laughs> do go back and supination just doesn't happen very often because it's, right. you know, it's weird. So pronation tends to be associated with that forward lean because you've got that, again, Monica's law. <laughs> on, on, usually on a horse, if you're in a, a supination, mm. usually you're restraining the horse, aren't you? Uh, I, it's, you're kind of in this middle line. Okay. I mean, you can pronate a little bit. But if you look at a horse, like people doing horse racing, right. then they're down in oh, pronation. Yeah. Then we get in like... Oh, and then if you look at people doing dressage, yeah. then they're in <laughs> supination. So isn't that usually just to do with letting the horse's head forward or bringing the horse's think, head back? I think it's whether you're... I mean, when you're horse racing, you want to accelerate. Mm. I think that pronation position is... The other thing to mention, of course, is military horsemanship. Both the, the oh, reins are in yeah. one hand. That's right. So, <laughs> so this hand is usually left free. Right. Um, and is usually used to steer, together with the knees, I okay. guess. Used to steer left and right, so... It's a huge black spot, or <laughs> blank spot of what I'm looking at right yeah. now. I need to get on a horse. But, I get, but as far as I understand it, I'm not a, I'm not a rider by any means, <laughs> but I've had a couple of lessons. And... Um, as I understand it, uh, the moment that you didn't need this hand free, right. you'd go back to having the reins in two hands because right. you've got better right. control with the reins in two hands. But yeah. if you need to use a weapon, you have to put both of the reins in. <laughs> and even if you're using a shield, generally speaking, you'd be holding the reins in the left hand behind the shield. Um, but yeah, okay, so that's your ongoing work, basically looking at this, at yeah. this whole topic. And, and um, it is interesting. Oh, you mentioned Burton. Let's talk a little bit about Burton okay. uh, before we wrap up. Um, but it is interesting to me that I've o always overlooked Angelo's um, extension motions, but they're in the manuals from 1813 right the way through to 1875. And then Burton still has them in 1876 in his manual where he's completely slated Angelo, and yet he still includes the extension motions. So what does Burton give us this? Well, the weird thing, weird thing about Burton, which I have to look at, is he has almost a paragraph of uh, listings of people who've written about the body mechanics and the, you know, the physical mm. scientific exercises mm. and that he's not qualified to talk about it. Right. So I haven't okay. That's a very stuff. unusual thing for Burton yeah. to say that he's not qualified to talk <laughs> about <laughs> something. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things. I don't even know if they exist. I haven't even mm. started. I haven't even Googled them yet. So maybe he may have just made them up. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I'm on a bit of a mission oh, against Burton here. Um, but he has, he, oh, I'm trying to think what the big points of Burton were. He talks a lot about the, um, whether or not you have all the weight on your back. And the problem if you back weighting, oh, I mean, there's a school of people who will just put everything on their back foot. Like yeah. That. 
And then there's something you get this more in like the Tai Chi stuff I was studying, where your your center is still in the center, but your weight is sort of 90-10 on the back foot, mm. and it doesn't look like you know I'm not this, but I'm here, and I can still do you know the foot stomp of the assault. Yeah. But it's different. It's like I'm here, and like I don't have very much hang time when yeah. that comes up. But it's a different kind of body mechanics. Here mm. is something else. You know, I'm forming a pillar here. I've got this arch. I can do stuff with my mm. hip. So again, this is something that I've always looked at from a purely tactical kind of fencing point of view. And if you look at the 18th century sources, be it um, quite a lot of small sword material, um, but equally if we look at um, Angelo's um, broadsword or sabre um, stuff, you can see that it's back weighted and we explicitly see in the middle of the 19th century a lot of um, manuals start to say that you should put the weight equally on both legs and I've always thought about this from a sort of practical fencing point of view. First of all it's less, if you've got the weight equally on both legs it's less tiring okay but equally if I want to attack it's quicker for me to attack if the weight is equally between both. If I put the weight on the back leg it makes it much slower for me to attack okay um, the back leg is now more tired and is more strained but I think most people's interpretation of that has been of like why would you put the weight on the back leg has been for defensive purposes so we know that for example Angelo whenever he guards he also slips that front leg well it's a lot easier and quicker to do that if you've got very little weight on that front leg Equally, it brings the body and the face slightly further away from the opponent. So for defensive purposes, it may possibly, debatably, be better. Um, but I find it very interesting that there may be yet another element to this as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's related to the sort of things that we've been talking about. Well, the other thing I should mention, the supination and pronation, is that if you want to generate power, you have to go from supination to pronation. It's about you expend yourself. Maybe even that's what George Silver was talking about. If I fully pronated, I can't pronate anymore. I have to supinate to get access to that same power of using my torso. So even Musgrave Waits talks about um, forming the guard yeah. as a way of preparing to... I mean, this is yeah. why I try to pull well, this so, out. So I'm going to stop you there. And actually, so okay. we're going to wrap this video up talking about Angelo. Okay. And we're going to do another short video talking about John Musgrave Waite, who is one of, obviously, my main go-to sources and is another source you can find linked below this video. But I think it's a universal concept to everyone who's doing this. It just wasn't explicitly stated because I don't think they knew. They didn't have the anatomy. They didn't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and it does seem that um, in the 18th century, people were learning this kind of stuff related to riding and, and dance as right. well as fencing. And then there was a kind of period of almost like a dark ages for, for this stuff. And then it seems to there seems to have been a growing interest at the end of the 19th century, doesn't mm -hmm. there, for this. Uh, I get the, you know, you know, if we look at the use of the Indian clubs and all kinds right. of, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, just suppose. physical, you know, physical culture, I suppose they called it, didn't they? Um, where people started to look a little bit more at the science or what they understood to be the science some of it obviously was perhaps a bit wrong or um, they were still trying to find the explanations for certain things but they started at the end of the 19th century i think to start looking at the science of what physically was that and we certainly see this hinted at either side of the year 1900 with fencing um, manuals we start to see them trying to analyze why they do certain things right, right. It, almost in a medical point of view, don't they? But the problem with that is if you don't have the right science, because you know they didn't have myofascial networks, they didn't have, you know, it was very much a sort of classical model, mm. a compression structure, I think is what it's called, the idea mm. that your bones hold you up like pillars, yeah. and your muscles move your bones around. So once you get this idea of a myofascial network, that's when pronation and supination have a scientific basis, you can talk about this. If you don't have the vocabulary, it, you, it can be a practice, you know, it can mm. be a tradition, but it can't really be a science until you've got that. And even now it's not a science. Mm. The kind of father of this, you know, Thomas Myers, he's totally frank. He's like, this is anecdotal, this is observational, this is what I think. And if someone has a better system, come tell me and we'll change it. But until then, this is the best he knows. So, um, yeah. And it's been adapted by a lot of people. 
Well, it's very cool stuff, and it's and it's pretty much new to me. Um, and uh, I think it's great that for people like me who are really buried in these, uh, for me particularly Victorian and to a lesser degree Georgian period um, fencing treatises, we've now got another. Uh, direction to attack these sources from and interrogate them and try and understand what people were trying to convey in these manuals because I think there are definitely some aspects of some of these that have been overlooked or ignored and the, the um, these e extension motion exercises I think deserve more attention than they have got in the past. Um, so anyway thank you very much Jim hey. and um, we will do another little video talking about a couple of well, we'll do a couple of other videos talking about some other things but uh, cheers and see you for the next video. Thanks for watching please subscribe we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.